Hello everyone and welcome to Bash Course Quarantine U.S. History. My name is April and today we're going to talk about the late 19th century second industrial revolution and society. So by late 19th century, I'm describing the period approximately between the end of the Civil War to the turn of the century when progressivism and international dominance began. A key theme of the period is a massive wave of industrialization known as the Second Industrial Revolution. The economy shifted from agrarian to industrial, profoundly changing American society as well. It was characterized by increase in the number of factories, wider usage of interchangeable parts, assembly lines, scientific management, mechanization, and other developments that made factories more efficient and standard. The rise of economies of scale, where companies produce more so that they can sell at lower prices, and widespread mass production. Larger and more interconnected markets, bigger, wealthier, and more powerful industrial corporations, greater specialization, and advances in technology such as railroads, telegraph, steel, and factory machines. By the end of this period, the United States was known as an industrial power in the world. There were many causes of this industrialization. Civil war pressures, greater access to capital, immigration, industrialist monopolistic tactics, government support, expansion of railroads, and access to raw materials. During the Civil War, both sides needed materials like guns and clothes, fast, and they were willing to pay a lot of money for them, so companies were pushed to work more efficiently, moving to interchangeable parts and assembly lines, laying the groundwork for mass production to take over. Europeans saw American potential and invested, providing capital that stimulated growth. Many companies also became publicly traded, further expanding available capital and decreasing risk. Population tripled from 1850 to 1900 with nearly a third of growth coming from immigration. This large influx of immigrants created a large cheap labor pool for industry. Immigrants made up 15% of the population in 1890, which is slightly more than today. Most of them came for economic opportunity or to escape persecution. The increase in size and number of factories which reside in cities stimulated the growth of cities in a process called urbanization. Millions of rural workers and immigrants moved to cities to work in factories, which tended to be in the Northeast and Midwest. They were paid badly, however, and inner cities were marked by intense poverty. Families lived on top of each other, allowing disease to spread, and children as well as adults worked long 10 plus hour work days in dangerous conditions. Within diverse cities, urban neighborhoods tended to be highly ethnically homogenous. The immigrants to the East Coast mostly came from Eastern European countries, Italy and Ireland. They were less educated and wealthy than previous waves of immigrants. Neglected by employers and national politicians, the urban working class turned to their municipal governments, which were run by corrupt but helpful political machines. These huge factories needed middle managers, accountants, secretaries, engineers, and the expanded cities needed teachers and municipal officials, what we now call white collar workers greatly expanding the small middle class. Many used their means to move to surrounding suburbs, further entrenching inner cities in poverty and machine politics. This was also helped by the invention of the streetcar. As the middle class grew in numbers, the rich got richer, creating a class of millionaires whose lavish lifestyles helped name the period the Gilded Age and made them American royalty. These included railroad steel and oil tycoons, Vanderbilt, Carnegie, and Rockefeller. Unlike traditional royalty, many of these men were seen as self-made titans of industry who worked up from humble backgrounds. They were also known as robber barons to recognize that they actively exploited workers and used unfair business practices. In addition to subjecting workers to dangerous conditions and low pay, companies also became profitable through monopolistic and untransparent business practices. Companies like Standard Oil ruthlessly bought out competition. Railroad companies would pool to make behind-the-scenes deals, and vertical integration also became popular. Back then, the government, including courts, was very supportive of business through laissez-faire policy that allowed these practices. It took decades for government to regulate this, but people like muckraker Ida Tarbell actively criticized it at the time. Workers also criticized their own exploitation by joining labor unions to push for better treatment. 
The most notable were the Knights of Labor and American Federation of Labor, but there were many and a huge amount of workers joined. One tactic was striking. For example, in 1877, unions organized a massive strike throughout the vital railroad system. However, it was broken up by the government under President Hayes, violently. This shows the government's crucial support of business during the period, as well as businesses' zero tolerance of strikes. Companies used a variety of tactics, including banning union membership through yellow dog contracts and using more desperate people as strike breakers. Railroads are actually really cool in this period, and always, because they're very vital to many different aspects of industrialization. They show technological innovation by integrating lines and building the transcontinental railroad. They were one of the first example of technological advances brought, brought by the first industrial revolution. And then their business practices showed industrial tactics. The subsidies given to railroad companies are an example of the government's active support of business in a generally laissez-faire time. Most importantly, they helped spread mass-produced industrial products all over the country, and they enabled the use of Western mine materials in Eastern industry. Access to raw materials was one of the factors that allowed industry to explode in America. By this point, Manifest Destiny was essentially completed. As the Turner thesis remarked, a new era was emerging. The West was now being mined for silver and coal, the latter of which what was literally fueling factories, which were often across the country. The West also became very important for agriculture. Vast plains and the great American desert were turned into cattle pasture or grain fields. It was accelerated by the Homestead Act, which essentially gave families land to farm. People flocked westward to mine and farm, giving us the iconic boomtown and western culture. Unfortunately, this wasn't at everyone's benefit. Restrictive immigration policy began with the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, because American workers felt threatened by Chinese immigrants who came for mining jobs. Settlers seeking farmland pushed Native Americans, many of whom had already been kicked off their homelands onto reservations earlier in the century, off their land. In the resulting Indian Wars, settlers and government troops fought and often massacred indigenous people. Then, the Dawes Severalty Act of 1877 sought to assimilate and break down indigenous society by dividing reservations into plots of land. The settlers also decimated the large bison population, which, is a, which was a part of some indigenous group's way of life. During this period, the ghost dance religious movement emerged as a reactionary revival of indigenous culture. Additionally, these events helped lay the groundwork for the progressive era conservation movement, though it was also racist against indigenous people. In other news, the Civil War just hugely changed the South, where it was mostly fought. Physically, parts of it were ravaged by Sherman's march. Economically, agriculture, which dominated the South's economy, had to adapt to not using enslaved people and the rise of industry. It also still had heavy Northern influence from Reconstruction. Consequently, the South partook in some industrialization, giving it the name the New South. For example, Virginia began leading in the tobacco industry. Southern textile production actually surpassed that of the North by the end of this period, Keeping in mind that New England and textiles was where U.S. industrialization really began a century before. Still, the South continued to be dominantly agrarian, but life on the farm was not immune to changes brought by the Second Industrial Revolution. As mass production rose, people bought far more of the goods they'd made by hand in the past. In general, agriculture shifted from small subsistence farms toward a more industrial model. That meant farms increasing their usage of machines, wage labor, simply being larger and employing more people, and growing one or two crops, specialization, as opposed to many crops like a small subsistence farm. Still, smaller farms remained, and they were suffering from competition with larger farms able to sell at cheap prices, and they were being taken advantage of by monopolistic industrial corporations, middlemen, and railroads. These struggling farmers adopted a similar approach to urban workers. They banded together. One of the biggest organizations was the National Grange Movement, which had some success in regulation. There were also various farmers' alliances. During the period, farmers started laying down their political goals, such as free silver. This is the origin of the populist movement. Despite their opposition to the exploitation of farmers, many of these organizations excluded African-American sharecroppers, which was keeping them from any type of social mobility. At the same time, Jim Crow laws and racial violence were on the rise after Reconstruction was abandoned. 
For example, the Supreme Court case Plessy v. Ferguson issued its landmark separate but equal defense of segregation in 1896. On that note, let's look at some art. Impressionism in painting, it was the trend in Europe and shows the U.S. catching up to European sophistication with an American appreciation for nature. And literature's got novels about American life and education is growing and literacy is growing. That's it for now. Thank you for watching. The Bash Course quarantine team is Sandra Ansari, Sam Mensimer, Eamon Cole, Pasha Ishak, Estella Milan, and myself.